Wordle has been one of those little things that seems so innocuous, right? Like, whatever, it's a one puzzle a day. And I, when it first started happening, I didn't know, you know, I would see these tweets. I didn't understand what those little boxes were that were showing up in my timeline feeds and everywhere else. It just kind of confused me. Um, and so we wanted to, uh, you know, I, I started seeing them, started playing the game. My family enjoyed the game. And I wanted to like start to figure out, can I tell anything from the result tweets? I'm not looking, you know, there have been people that have written all kinds of stuff in every language about how to solve a Wordle puzzle, right? Like they know there's 12,000 five letter words and they know this and that. I wasn't looking to do any of that. I was just like, what could I tell over a period of time about different puzzles, maybe statistically how likely people were to get a result within two or three or four guesses, depending on how good their first guess was. It just interested me. I'm like, it's just these green and yellow boxes. What can I do? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. It, it follows on nicely with Jim's talk. Uh, so Jim works for Twitter. And for this, I had never used the, the newest API of Twitter. So we have been streaming uh, some Twitter results into a database. And we want to talk to you about how you can take something as simple as some emojis and turning that into usable data that you can do queries with in Postgres. And I just think that's kind of cool. So go ahead and advance the slide. Uh, here's the basic agenda. Oh, will you let me Sorry, change we... the slide? There we go. I'll just have to do it manually. So uh, we're going to talk about what the results data looks like, how we can actually take that. So mining the API really briefly and then extracting that data. You know, How can we turn those little blocks of emojis into something we can do? And then Miranda has a bunch of really fun little queries to look at, like actually answering some of those questions. It's really cool. So let's go ahead, advance the slide. So Wordle data. So we all know what Wordle data looks like. And the next slide, right? This is yesterday's. I hope I'm not, uh, you know, what's well, yesterday's. You can't get back to you, right? So Just ruined um, it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I did. I ruined it. I, I had solved it before I did this in four, not in three. And so- um, I was going to say, this is you know. kind of- too good, Ryan. Are you sure? I know it's I'm too good. Kidding. I'm kidding with you. No, I almost had it. I almost had it in three. I actually had stove, and then I'm like, that's too easy. So I turned it to stoke. Mm. I was kind of upset. Anyway, that's so fair. we take this, and then at the end of the game, you can go ahead and, and put your uh, you know, emoji up in social media somewhere. You can just share it. And this is all we get. Now there are at least four combinations for the exact same thing because there's a high contrast colorblind mode. And there's a normal mode. So we had to be able to count for all of this to find the data. And so I had to you know, learn a little bit about the Twitter API, some of the new improvements they've made so that I could query this data and stream it into a database. So let's go ahead and see what we did with that. You know, What could we get from this grid? I wanted to know. Inquiring minds want to know. So we uh, connected to the Twitter API, and, and I had to learn a little bit about it. Now, Jim gave you some great links in a previous talk. If you missed that talk, uh, please find it in our YouTube feed. Uh, if you're watching this talk afterwards, it was by Jim Moffitt. It was about using Twitter for uh, weather emergencies, um, flooding and so forth, and, and warning systems. And so with the new version two of the API, they've improved the way that you can kind of query this in, in their own language, you know, they're like uh, querying natural process language. So so I looked at the, the tweets, I looked at the result thing, and I, I had to narrow down the scope. Because as with anything, that is popular and good, what happens? There's a hundred different knockoffs um, with all kinds of combinations that might look like a Wordle puzzle, but it's not. And I knew there's no way to guarantee, right? This is just a, it's a tweet. Anyone could compose a tweet. There's no guarantee this is from Wordle, but we had to do the best we could. So these are some of my parameters I wanted to know going in. I just want to look at the English versions, you know, ones that were posted in an English language. Uh, you know, original tweets only, a lot of people like and retweet and reply to them. I didn't want to, uh, you know, get those for really for one reason. And that is just, there's a limitation in the number of tweets you can consume every month currently in that API. And so I just want to eliminate all possibilities to, to not use up that quota too quickly. Um, maybe limit it to countries. You know, there's a lot of countries have, you know, different variations. And so I was, if I could, I was going to try and see if I could figure out geotagging. Recent games only, so you know people 
again, compose tweets that aren't actually for today's. Uh, we were getting tweets originally like game one, game 8,000, game. So wasn't worth it. I think the most impressive was one person in the pre, like before we put on this parameter yeah. that um, one person tweeted, it was like 10 or 15 games in one day. And I was like, the yes. dedication. <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> Which means they're going in and changing their clock, right? Like finish the game, go change the clock, finish the game. <laughs> Uh, and then last but not least, I realized halfway through and, and pa partly because of my, my son uses the high, he's, he's colorblind. And so, uh, I, hi Bart, how you doing buddy? Yeah. Sorry. Um, I was, I was, I was I know, I saw excited Bart. that Bart was there. <laughs> um, so I realized I wasn't originally taking into consideration the high contrast colorblind mode either. So I wanted to do that to kind of get the full yeah. bandwidth, uh, gamut of, of responses. Uh, and honestly, I actually have a small group of friends that I, I do a wordle puzzle with and we share results every day through a, through an app and one of my friends is colorblind was tweeting his and i wanted to capture them just so i'd have them that was the other reason i, I did that all right so there's our parameters and so what that ends up looking like um with uh, the twitter api if you go to the next slide is uh this kind of query and so there's probably other things I could have done. I, I tested a bunch of things, and honestly, the easiest way to do this was by going to Twitter uh, because I wasn't using up my API limit. Testing various search parameters, you can actually do some of this uh, right through the Twitter search API uh, in Twitter. And so this is what we came up with. It has to have the word Wordle. It has to have combinations of the you know red or orange and blue box or combinations of the blue and green. It turns out that I could have added the white and black as well, uh, but through the Python API, I talk about this later, I was just having problems getting it to, to actually save. Those two emojis start or end, I forget what it is, at a different part of the UTF character set. And something about the Python, it did not like them. I could get them, but I couldn't save it to the search. So I gave up, I said, we're just gonna do this. Uh, and then isn't retweet, is not a reply, is not a quote. And I actually added the, the hyphen ES. There's a lot of English postings. So language is English, but they're from the Spanish version apparently. And so I, I was just getting lots of those. So I cut that out as well. So using that search, we are able to get a tweet that looks like this. This is the data that we would get. It's a JSON packet, right? It's pretty straightforward. Now uh, through the API, which we're not getting it into, you can uh, you know decide which parameters you get back in the JSON response. For our needs, I mostly wanted to know user, time of day, the tweet text, and then I wanted to know the location, whether they were verified, in case in the future we wanted to do something with that. Now, it turns out the location is not geolocation. Anyone can put whatever they want there. So we had lots of people from, you know, uh, Disneyland and uh, the North Pole, Things like that. So it realized it probably wasn't. How do you that know useful, that they're not from Disneyland, Ryan? That is true. They could be living there. They and that's could be living there. <laughs> yeah, doing Wordle every day. This is where I go to do my Wordle puzzle. Hey, maybe they so, work there. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. All right. So we so we have the data, and now we have to figure out how to do something with this. So this is the packet that my streaming Python script is getting, and I had to figure something out. You know, how do we store this? Well, what I did realize along the way, just want to bring up a couple things, again, as a kind of a novice user of the new Twitter API, the V2 API, um, for some reason, I just, it wasn't worth me spending, if you want to go back one slide, it wasn't worth me spending a lot of time in this, but something about the Python uh, SDK that they are providing, or maybe it's something I was doing, those two emojis, I just couldn't get the Twitter streaming API. So basically you set that search string. When you start your connection, you say, here's my search string and then you subscribe to that stream, I could not, I tried after 45 minutes, I'm like, I'm done, it's not worth this. So I just took those out of my search for now. Um, if someone posted a Wordle result that had literally no yellows or greens, that's a really, really bad day. And I don't know how you get that. So uh, I was pretty confident I would get at least one with a green or a yellow or a orange or red, blue. Uh, streaming was inconsistent. So again, this is not my primary uh, job in life. Uh, some days, in fact, the stream's been going for about 18 hours now, the, the streaming API request, but then some days it would stop five, six, seven times in a day. And I'm sure there's a reason I just haven't 
had time to uh, reach out and figure out why that is, something to know. And then currently the limits are either, I think it's 500,000 or 2 million tweets per month. Uh, on the V2 API, they don't have a way to buy more. So with this current, uh, we have, get about 130 to 160 tweets, a, a thousand tweets a day. That means we could probably get 10 to 12 days of data per month. So today's data set has uh, about five. Some of those are inconsistent because the script stopped now and again. And like I said, there's no way to distinguish real versus fake because it is what it is, right? All right, so we had that JSON packet. And then we had to figure out how to store it. So they're really, uh, you know, the, the main thing here was, um, do I want to do processing in Python beforehand? Or do I just want to save the JSON data and go ahead and, and figure out how to do it all in SQL? And, you know, after I spent a little bit of time, it, it just seemed more efficient to go ahead and create a schema like this. We probably could have done more. That stored the basic information first. I didn't pull everything apart. The, the JSON, the Twitter... Uh, post was left untouched. I did all of that work you'll see in a minute in SQL, uh, partially because I really wanted to see how, how effective or efficient I could get at transforming all of this, something I wouldn't normally do. Uh, and so go ahead and uh, hit the, the down arrow, you'll get a little box. The one thing we did do is I still saved the whole uh, JSON text that we got from the API in case later in life, you know, later we're like, oh, I wish we would have X. Well, we still have the JSON response and we could parse it apart because Postgres is great at doing JSON uh, querying, right? So um, so that's what we stored the data into. So this table currently in our system has, I think about five or 600,000 rows, uh, something like that. So now we have the data and we need to now transform it. I still can't do much with this. I, I know, you know who tweeted it. I know whether they're verified. I know the time of day, but I don't know what they're, you know, and I know that they got the puzzle in four guesses, but I don't know anything else because it's all trapped inside of that tweet and I want to extract it some. And so we take, <clears throat> oh, uh, I did not. So uh, thank you for the question. That was a sample just as the overall schema. I, I'm not getting into the details of, you know, what indexes and so forth, mostly just because we have such a short time to talk about this. Miranda and I will be working on a post that digs into this a little bit deeper, um, hopefully in the next month or so. We both are talking about how much we enjoyed this. And so we'll, we'll try and give you a little bit more info, just kind of how we approach some of that stuff. So great question. I'm just not showing you all the details here. And so now I have that data and we're gonna go ahead and extract it, right? So this is where I think so many people, you can go to the next slide. Um, so many people forget, or maybe they just don't know, they come from a different technology and they do end up doing so much work inside of like a Python script. And Miranda, you and I have talked about this a ton, um, where in, a, in data science even, there's so much power in something like Python, but you end up doing so much of this stuff in a script that really could be parsed down into the database if it has the ability to do it. Now everyone gets access to it. You don't have to pass scripts around. They're doing all this complex array logic and pulling things apart and transforming text. Could we do all that in the database? And so that's why I wanted to see. And so now I need to take those boxes, right? There's, in theory, a total of 30 boxes, uh, little uh, emojis that could mean something to us. So every row is a guess, and every position in that row is a letter. And you either get the letter right, you don't get the letter at all, or you got a letter, but it's it's just in the wrong position. It's It's somewhere else in the word for the day. So we could go about storing the results in one of at least two ways. We typically talk about this in time series world. Um, you know, whether you do a wide table for your time series data, which implies that for every row, it's a time stamped event and all of the unique pieces of information you want to know about that timestamp are in that row. Uh, so you literally spread it all out. So in something like this, I might have you know, 30 columns, one that represents every possible letter for a full puzzle, uh, you know, the original matrix, you're really spreading this whole thing out, which in a situation like this didn't make a lot of sense. If those were unique measurements, that makes a little bit more sense. It's, it's a little less easy to use, or probably a lot less easy to use, uh, to query things by, you know, 30 different columns when you're trying to find this kind of data. So what we did instead was to go to, in the next slide, the uh, what we would call kind of a narrow uh, result. So 
we take one tweet, which is one row in the other table, and we break it apart into however many guesses there were in that tweet. So the, the guess table that kind of pulls all this apart has one row for every guess of that user's tweet for that day's puzzle. So if they got it in three guesses, they only have three rows in this table. If they got it in six, they have six for that day for that puzzle. Now, the nice thing here is, uh, you know, you can do a lot of indexing on specific columns like guest number. Uh, you know, when you're querying for position, you're not having to think about, well, it's position, uh, you know, one and position uh, six and position, you know, for each guest and so forth. So that just makes it a little bit easier to work through uh, from a query perspective. And then as we were going about it, the other thing that we thought just from a data science perspective, when you're thinking about querying data like this, you know, yes, we could have simply done a lot of work so that all of our queries only looked at the five columns that represent that day's, you know, each letter of that guess. But really for already processing the data, why not just pull it apart and go ahead and count up how many correct and incorrect values for that guess, not position, but how many, so we could slice and dice a little bit easier down the road. And so uh, we take all that. This is uh, the sample query we came up with. We're going to breeze through this uh, again. We will probably have a, um, <clears throat> uh-oh, someone is holding a hope. Uh, yes, we will do the, um, the hopefully the, the thunderstorm isn't coming here for the last couple of minutes. Um, so if you go to the next slide, there's a lot that Postgres can do. And I'm going to really quickly keep going. How do we turn this into meaningful data? Um, this is one sample query. Now we will at, at some point in the future parse this apart in a little bit more detail through a blog post or something. Uh, the basics are this: Postgres is really great at arrays, uh, in doing regex, a lot of things you're normally used to, but now you can do this in in the database. And so the long and short is: this is a script I made. It's a, a, I say script. It's really just a single query that uses um, some things not necessarily known about in Postgres. Things like locked for update. Um, and if you want to hit down a couple of times, I think I highlight a couple of these. Um, basically, we're taking 100 rows at a time. This is just as the data is coming in, this query is also running. It's taking 100 rows of data just over and over again from the table. It takes that data, says, hey, does the tweet have at least one row of five emojis that match any of these together, right? And so if it does, it splits it out as one result row. And then we take each of those result rows, we clean it up into effectively uh, numbers. So rather than red, yellow, green, because we have two different variations, we just said, hey, two means they got the letter in the right spot. One means it is the right letter for the word, but the wrong position. And zero means it's just the wrong letter. There's That letter doesn't exist today. So that's what the clean guesses means. And then finally, we take that guess and we actually do the count of how many correct, incorrect, and partials we have. And we finish it up by inserting it into that table. And so uh, you can skip through the next couple slides. I just really quickly talk about this. I break these out. So this is saying, hey, are there five per row? It does the ordinality, which, which is really necessary because it gives us the row number. Uh, what the guesses are, you know, changes them into numbers to make it easier to process because there's those variations, black and white and yellow and uh, I think orange and then blue and green. All those things mean something different. So. And then finally, we actually take that cleaned up guess, we split it apart into the individual characters to save it into that guess row, and we have our counts. And so that gets us that table of information. So from, I didn't do the counts uh, for the last couple hours, but let's, I think that's the end of the slides. Um, so yeah, so that means this gets turned into something else. We're gonna look at some uh, queries. Oh, sorry. So this is the, yeah, I did forget I actually had this. Uh, this is what- I was going to say, we're not so, close to the end of the slides. <laughs> well, there's there's some other stuff that I just copied <laughs> at the end. Um, that just means every guess is has a numerical value. So every, you know, how many guesses, you know, this is guess number one in this case for game 279. Uh, you know, letter five was correct. It was the right letter in the right place. And letter three was a correct letter, but in the wrong place. And we can see that we have three letters yet to guess, one that we need to shift around and so forth. So that is what the result looks like. And now we can go ahead and run queries on it. All through SQL, just taking that text, those emojis, doing a little bit of SQL on it, and splitting it out. So uh, I think you now have uh, the queries itself to show. Yes, I'm going to pull up dbeaver. 
which we now have. Um, if you're not familiar with dBeaver, it is a common, um, like, uh, wow, GUI tool that we use to kind of do um, Postgres queries, essentially, and, you know, time scale and stuff. So Ryan kind of gave you a quick overview of the data and how we are storing it and all that good stuff. So now we can start to like ask some of the questions um, that actually, you know, have us analyzing the data, right? Because that's really the whole goal of collecting data is to analyze it. So um, we'll just go through a few queries here. Um, and don't worry, we will, uh, like Ryan said, we're going to do a, probably a blog post on this later because we have lots of fun queries that we want to cover, uh, but just don't have time for. So kind of my, it, one of our initial thoughts is like, how many Twitter users do we have tweets from in total right now with what we have in the data, in the, in the database right now? Um, and so I just do a count on unique author ID and then also do a count on um, unique tweet ID. So that should give us, right, the number of people that are right, that we're collecting tweets from and how many tweets that they actually made. And so as you can see, um, we have 228,000 distinct users that we're collecting tweets from with a total of 510,000 tweets that they, you know, made total. So how about some more interesting things? And um, so one, one thing that Ryan kind of hit on earlier is that we can't guarantee a lot of, um, th that we're getting super clean data here. So uh, of course, you know, we want to check, are there instances where we're getting tweets that probably shouldn't be counted, you know, when we're trying to actually do analytical queries, um, like looking at, you know, the average guest time for a certain game, you know, we don't really want, you know, cases where we might have like 10 or 13 um, different guest lines, you know, from a, a tweet that somehow got into the database system. Um, and as you can see, so if I run this portion of this select statement, this is grabbing the um, unique tweet IDs and then the count of guesses um, for their, for that unique tweet. Um, and if, as you can see, Someone and this is really only, went for it with 24. Yeah, so, so this is all, um, so these are only counting and showing guesses where they have more than six guesses, because, you know, for me, I'm thinking if we want to try and filter out the bad tweets, um, that, that, you know, and in Wordle, traditionally you only have six guesses. So if someone is guessing more than six times, then probably something is wrong with that tweet, or we're just collecting too many, too much information. So that's why I put that, um, having count guess, uh, the count of the guess greater than six, just so that we can figure out like what tweet IDs are like kind of bad or just dirty, I, like the, not ones that we want to have part of analysis. Yeah. And someone, um, so like this tweet ID, there were 24 counts. And in fact, we can look at exactly just because I think it's fun to double check, like what happened that we had 24 guesses. Like, is this, yeah, is this sure. accurate? What's going on here? Cause I, I also, whenever I'm doing any kind of analysis, I want to like dig into what's happening. Um, so I can kind of understand. And so if we look at the tweet, um, here I'll, uh, so this is the information table and this column has the tweet information. <laughs> and so if you, the zoomed in version, you could kind of get, a uh, uh, oh, now just, okay. So as you can see, it's somehow they, I don't know if it's that they copied in like a bunch of wordles and one tweet or I, we don't really know what's happening there, but <laughs> it is accurate that they had 26 guesses. And of course we don't want to include those for our analytics right. functions. So, and if we, if we run, um, the CTE of kind of pulling these, these filtered tweets, um, we can see that there are 947 
tweets in our in our database that are counting more than six guesses. So that's 946 tweets that we can kind of like, okay, filter out, throw those out because those are gonna like cause issues with an, the any kind of analysis. So now that we have um, kind of like those filtered tweets, I'll actually skip down to the filter tweets. So this this portion right here is basically just grabbing the the tweet IDs for um, only the cl like clean tweets. So it's just I'm you know putting that parameter that the count has to be less than or equal than six. Um, and then with that parameter or that constraint, you know, all the tweet IDs theoretically should be, you know, th there's a higher likelihood that they're okay to include in analysis. Um, and so that's just kind of like a quick filter to just give us, again, like you would, for official analysis, you would want to do way more cleaning, like way more. We only got a few minutes here. <laughs> way, way more, yes. Um, so, you know, that's just what the CTE part of this is. Um, and then we can select the average guess amount um, filtering for these two games. So I just want to look at two games in particular. So that's like two days of data, essentially. Um, and then I just join with the tweets. And so we can, you know, get get an idea, an idea of like, oh, for game 279, People had a better chance of getting it on average than uh, earlier um, rather mm -hmm. than 282. So that's like, you know, cool information to keep in mind. And then the last query. That I'm not going to lie. 282. I got it. I, I didn't get it. It's, there were it, too it, many it, choices it was, and I was annoyed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that other well, people and, suffered too. Yeah. So that's actually this last query that we're going to look at is looking at kind of exactly that to see, oh. you know, I want to look at game 282, what happened. So this, this query that I'm going to run. Um, so this first part in the CTE, if I run that, this is giving me the total. So this column tells me, um, it essentially I used our time bucket function from time, like the time scale DB time bucket function to bucket all of the tweets per hour. So I'm counting how many tweets uh, are being like collected per hour. And then I'm actually giving the results for um, when they won. So okay. like per hour, the counts of tweets that got the um, correct word per line. So for gotcha. like, for example, if we look at this row three, there were 85 total tweets. Um, oh, do you mind moving us? Uh, Attila to the move me side. Out of the way for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. It's a little bit smaller, which I apologize, but at least that way you can see the <laughs> query. So t a total of 85 tweets um, were, were made in this time bucket hour. 20 people took six guesses to win the game. 18 people took five guesses to win the game. You know, 28 right. took four, 15 took three. And so on and so forth. So that's per, I just broke up like, you know, how many tweets, um, like what the kind of like spread was per hour. And of course, like for me, since there's such a varied amount of people um, putting in tweets per hourly bucket, it's hard to see like what percentage did people like how many people generally took six guesses versus five guesses versus four? And so that's right. the second part of this query is just um, taking the percentage of each um, guess, like given the total. Okay. So if I run this whole query, now I'm actually just taking it, I'm looking at the percentage based on the total for that time bucket. So if I look at this row 10, 24% of people that tweeted at this time, um, yeah, at that hour, they took six guesses. And then 25% took five guesses, 27% took four guesses, 17% took three. And as you can see, it actually was pretty consistent over the day. Like it, was. It, it's depending on the hour, 
people generally got about the same spread for how long it took them to get the Wordle. So that's kind of an interesting, you know, start to analysis that you could do. Um, I think that's pretty much all we have time for right now. But Let me just do the one really quickly. Do you have that last one? The uh, Just do one of them, the L2 guess. I think you have down below. L2 guess. I think it's that one oh, right there. Yes. So yes. Okay. just an example yeah. of, this is one of the questions I've always had, like, Hey, if someone gets it, you know, has so many letters in guess number X, one or two, how likely are they to get it before four guesses I'll, or something? I'll run like both so I think of them. you did this here. Okay. Yeah. So if you if you get for for the game 282, if you get which I did not get least, if you get at least two um letters correct, so not partially correct, they're correct in, in their right spots. Um, generally 25% of people could get it in three, um, 27 and four, 20, um, three and five and 23 and six guesses versus really if you don't have two letters correct for that game, 13% got it in three. And then it's, wow. it's kind of like a, a higher, so it, it I mean, to me, this yeah. definitely says you could probably analyze the like analyze this further, um, like and, and it would indicate to me like, oh, I probably like, there could be something here that if you get, you know, two correct within the first two lines, you're more likely to get the answer sooner, which I you know makes sense, but it's cool mm -hmm. to have um, you know like some some weight to that and like you know v validate like looking at this from a more statistical standpoint, so. That's so cool. Very neat. Yeah. 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 So, there's so much here. Fun data here. <laughs> I mean, I loved, we were talking the other night, uh, you know, about this data and we're like, oh, I don't know. Can we show much? And I think that all of a sudden, 45 minutes later, we're like, man, what else could we look at? It's something so simple. And that's the power of data. And honestly, mm -hmm. for us, you know, we say this, it's the power of time series data. It's the power of being able to do it with SQL is so much fun. It is, and it, it makes it so easy. Like, you know, probably none of these queries are, were optimized because we kind of created them last minute. <laughs> that's we're talking. You know, you're talking about it. What about this? <laughs> what about this? What about this? But that's kind of the beauty of SQL is that you can explore, and it's like so easy to explore data, and so easy to kind of like play around and, and clean it up and figure it out. Like this was, you know, just scratching the surface of what we could do with this data set and hopefully what we will do with this data set, because I think we're going to try and do a blog post or multiple or multiple. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Who knows? All right. That was awesome. Yeah. Thank you.